please take your seat. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Maggie Monahan. I'm a senior water resource control engineer at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, I like to think of myself as one of those new and enthusiastic staff that Tom referred to, although uh, <laughs> maybe I'm more mid-career at this point. So, um, But I've been at the Water Board for since 2016, and I'm in our Watershed Management Division. I uh, manage a section that covers uh, recycled water, wastewater discharges to land, as well as our industrial and construction stormwater program. So um, CECs touch all of my, my programs, and I have a, a strong interest in, in their management. And so today I'm moderating the session on one of, one of the CECs that needs no introduction. Um, it's PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. And if you're not familiar with it, um, you'll learn about it today, but if you're, um, you've also definitely been exposed to it. <laughs> it's in <laughs> it's in almost um, everything <laughs> um, from you know stain repellents, uh, water resistant clothing, uh, nonstick cookware. Um, the list goes on and on. Um, and so today we're going to see how it's showing up in bay fish um, and where it's coming from, as well as uh, some. Um, some uh, ways that we can manage it or control it. So I'll start with um, introducing our speakers. Uh, first, we'll have Dr. Jay Davis. You can call him Dr. Jay. He's the lead scientist for the RMP and co-director of SFEI's Clean Water Program. He is specialized in studying contaminants in bay fish since he joined the staff of the RMP in 1995. Next, we'll have Diana Lynn who leads the microplastics focus area for the RMP and also leads investigations of emerging contaminants in wastewater and PCB monitoring using passive samplers. The other hat Diana wears is the proud mom of a four-year-old energetic boy and thinking about what chemicals and plastics he's exposed to or releasing into the environment. And I can relate to that as I have three little boys, <laughs> uh, eight, six, and two. Um, with Diana, we have Lorian Fono, who's the executive director of the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, or BACWA, a joint powers agency whose members include the many municipalities and special districts that provide sanitary sewer service to more than 7 million people in the Bay Area. And last, we'll have Simona Bailon. Bailon sorry. Uh, she supervises the External Communications and Environmental Justice Unit in the Safer Consumer Products Program at the California Department of Toxic Substance Control and has led much of the program's work on PFAS. She has a PhD from UC Berkeley where she still teaches yoga on Thursday evenings if you're interested and occasionally lectures on environmental health topics. Her environmental work and teaching are inspired by her study of in internal martial arts and by her belief that our inner and outer environments mirror one another and equally deserve treasuring and protecting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jay, Dr. Jay. Thanks, Maggie. I was kicking around ideas for the, for the title for this talk and alliteration's good. So one idea I had was PFAS in the Bay, what's the fuss? But I decided against that one and, um, and just going with uh, um, what, you, what you see there. Um, we're gonna start the session with a talk about why the levels of PFAS in the Bay are a concern. And one of the data sets that's recently been expanded and that we'll be tracking and watching to see if we are making progress in identifying and reducing sources, which is the focus of the other two talks in the session. Um, Miguel Mendez, one of our excellent young scientists at SFEI, has led this study and he's done most of the work, but I'm presenting because Miguel couldn't make the trip in from our field office in Boston. So first, a little bit of background on PFAS to introduce the session. Public awareness of PFAS is high and they have received a lot of attention in the media. The attention is primarily driven by ubiquitous contamination of drinking water and concern for human exposure by that route, but PFAS are also a significant concern in aquatic ecosystems.
PFAS include thousands and thousands of compounds. Um, I hear varying numbers that uh, some, some, some get really huge for the, for the numbers that qualify as PFAS. In this talk, I'm going to focus on PFOS. Um, PFOS and PFOA are the most well-known and studied PFAS. Um, and the structures of PFOS and PFAS are shown on the bottom of the screen. The arrow uh, is hard to use here, so I'm just going to verbally guide you to things. So in the bottom left is PFOS. Uh, these chemicals consist, um, many of them consist of a long carbon chain with fluorines attached. And then at the end of the chain, there are different, different groups. So PFOS has a sulfonate group at the end of the chain, and PFOA. Um, is a similar chain length, eight carbons, but it's got a carboxylate group at the end. Um, these chemicals are used in countless consumer, commercial, and industrial products. It's pretty um, staggering how widely they're used. Um, and um, they've become a global problem from, the, from all these uses and from global transport of, of these chemicals. Um, they're highly persistent, which is why they're known as forever chemicals. Some of them are bioaccumulative. Um, as you'll see, there's an interesting contrast between PFOS and PFOA in that regard in fish. And some of them, uh, like PFOS and PFOA, are toxic to aquatic life in humans. PFAS monitoring in the bay uh, began with the study of sediment by Stanford in 2004. RMP monitoring began shortly after that and has generated a robust data set that covers sediment, water, fish, birds, seals, stormwater, and in partnership with Bay Area wastewater agencies, wastewater. I'm going to focus on the concern regarding fish um, concentration, concentrations in fish in the bay and human exposure, but we've also been tracking trends in bird eggs and seals and there are there's cause for concern due to their levels as well. Um, as important uh, background regarding fish contamination in the Bay, there's a consumption advisory that's um, been in place in various forms since 1994. This advisory um, poster, I think, is one of the best examples of turning RMP data into information. The, it, the advisory is based on RMP data. Um, and this shows how, uh, how it's turned into something that is put into people's hands and that can help inform their choices about safe fish consumption. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. It's, there's a lot going on in this advisory poster, but um, bottom line is it's pretty restrictive already for the sensitive population, which is children and women of childbearing age. And that's largely due to mercury, but also due to the PCB levels. Um, so there are many species where the advice for the sensitive population is do not consume. Um, one of the considerations with regard to developing or incorporating PFAS into the advisory is that um, it might not make much difference because the advisory is already pretty strict. Um, so, so that's why PFAS is not, uh, one of the reasons PFAS is not currently included in the assessment. Um, but I'll say now that OEHA is reconsidering that and evaluating data on PFAS in the Bay and on PFAS toxicology and, in, and on methods for developing advice for PFAS. So they are doing an assessment of whether and how to include PFAS in the advice. Um, RMP sport fish monitoring um, is the best in California, I can say that because I also lead the fish monitoring um, for the state of California for the swamp program. Uh, it's one of the best anywhere. It began in 1994 with one of those um, Bay Protection and Toxic Cleanup Program uh, funded as one of those funded studies. Uh, and then the RMP picked it up in 1997. We've monitored most recently in 2019 and we're currently monitoring on a five year cycle. We monitor 13 locations across the Bay. Um, some of them have been added for particular uh, locations of interest for PCBs. And we look at a range of species. That's how the advisory can include so many species on that, on that poster. Um, 16 species in 2019. 
We collect hundreds of samples, look at, look at many contaminants. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we, we look at uh, the, what Tom called the archaic contaminants, um, but we include things like dioxins and pesticides, organochlorine pesticides. And uh, we've started including PFAS in more recent rounds, but gaps remain. Um, the Bay is a big place. We're only monitoring 16 or 13 locations. Um, and um, we're, I'm gonna show you, uh, talk about an interesting study that's gonna fill gaps uh, in the Carquina Strait area, which you can see here has, has no RMP stations. So RMP PFAS sport fish monitoring. We've also got one of the best PFAS fish programs and data sets. It's the best in California. Um, there's a lot of PFAS work being done around the country where there's industrial contamination of PFAS. Um, so there are other good PFAS programs in the country, um, but we're, we're one of the best. Um, we began in 2009 and most recently in 2019, um, we try to do a lot with our limited budget for the sport fish monitoring. So uh, in PFAS, um, got a limited allocation of the budget in that year. And so we didn't, we didn't measure them everywhere, but we, we um, analyzed samples from six locations, um, not the full 13, five species instead of 16, and a, a smaller number of samples, only 16 samples. So for PFAS, as of 2019, there are even bigger gaps. Um, as a special study in 2022, uh, with funding from the RMP and supplemented by water board funding, um, we decided to take advantage of the, the strong archiving program that the, the RMP has, where we, um, when we collect samples like we did in 2019 for the sport fish, we, we analyze some, but we also archive many samples and this is really valuable as an insurance policy for our normal analyses but then also allows us to do retrospective studies of new contaminants like emerging contaminants where we can look at trends uh, going going back into the past um, so as this special study um, we with the uh, funding available, we, we were able to come up with a plan to look at four species. Um, we spread, spread we, we use archives from some from 2009, some from 2014, some from 2019. And we, we used a targeted analytical method for 40 PFAS. Um, and then um, this allows for us to, to look at the combined data set with this new supplemental data, with the data that was generated in 2019 and the previous years. So we, we were able to analyze 21 additional samples for 2019. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of arrow work here. I'm gonna explain that in a minute because it's hard to look at the screen and it's complicated. <laughs> but this, is, uh, this was the data set that we generated in 2019 with the 16 samples that I mentioned. And let me walk you through this graph. Um, it's showing the species that we analyzed on the y-axis. The bars are average concentrations, and then the points show the individual samples. These are all composite samples representing multiple fish. And then the color coding indicates locations. Um, there are two thresholds shown on the graph. California doesn't have a threshold yet. Um, I mentioned OEI is thinking about uh, developing one. Um, but in the absence of that, for reference, we're using thresholds developed by the state of Massachusetts, um, one at three and a half parts per billion for, at a one serving per week threshold for PFOS, and then another, they have an action level that's quite low at 0 0.22 parts per billion. So using these for reference, um, and especially looking at the three and a half part per billion threshold, um, all of these samples that are blue are, are from South Bay. And then there, there's one at the top that's um, the, the largemouth bass sample, which is from Artesian Slough right below the San Jose um, outfall. So that's a freshwater area. So that's why we get largemouth bass there. All of the samples from that spot and the rest of South Bay were above that three and a half parts per billion threshold. Um, and then, um, 
the um, the other other species, uh, other the, the samples from other locations in the bay, very limited number of samples were were below that threshold and uh, but still above the lower Massachusetts threshold. Um, so I want you to focus on the Shiner surf perch and then the white croaker, where those are the species that we analyzed more samples for in the, in, in the uh, supplemental study. So adding in these samples, um, looking at Shiner surf perch, let me get the arrow there again. There we go. So we had these three points before, and then as, as a result of this study, we got Shiner surf perch from a bunch more locations. Um, if you've heard me talk about RMP fish data in the past, you've heard me say that Shiner surf perch are a great spatial indicator. Um, we, we put 20 fish into each composite and they have a small home range, so we can do good spatial comparisons. And uh, we focused on the South Bay with our original data set and because we'd seen higher level, we thought we were seeing high, higher levels there and uh, the Shiner surf perch underscore that the South Bay does have higher levels. Um, the, the colored points cluster together. So um, that's an indication that there are spatial differences. Um, Richmond Harbor is one of our sampling locations that had the lower levels in purple. So um, using this good spatial indicator, we do see spatial variation across the bay. Um, so with, uh, with the new data set now, the, you know, a more complete data set, not all of the South Bay samples are above that threshold. Um, and two, only two of the averages are above. Um, I also wanna mention White Croker where we filled in the data set and we got one white croaker sample from South Bay, which was higher than the others, the blue dot versus the other green ones. So there's a consistent um, signal that South Bay has higher levels. Okay, um, now I wanna break down the, the data um, showing the, the other PFAS compounds that are, are measured, uh, the 40, we measured 40. And this graph takes a little while to there's a lot going on here as well. The PFAS concentrations are shown by the bars. Um, this is showing different locations and different species. And the colors are showing all the different PFAS. Um, PFOS is in the green, which is the biggest uh, section of most of the bars. Um, notably absent is PFOA. So PFOA is not accumulating in, in our fish. Um, PFOS is more of, more of an accumulator, more of a concern. The second most detected compound was PFOSA, which is a precursor for PFOS, and actually fish turn that into PFOS through metabolism. Um, so PFOS is the main concern out of all these, but we do see some long chain uh, PFCAs, the carboxylic acids. Another PFAS that we didn't see was Gen X, which is one of the newer PFAS. Um, but aside from well, in addition to PFOS and PFOSA, we're, we're seeing mostly long-chained compounds. And then we are sporadically seeing some of the precursor compounds uh, that can be turned into uh, the more persistent um, uh, PFAS like, like PFOS. So at San Francisco, we, we found this uh, 7,3 FTCA compound that gets converted into the carboxylic acid uh, PFAS. And then uh, just again, this, this sh highlighting the South Bay, um, the, 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 uh, for each of the species, the South Bay had the highest concentrations. And then this is showing another view of the Shiner data where we're showing the variation among the locations for Shiner surf perch. And then we're starting to um, have the ability to look at trends over time. Although um, the database is pretty spotty, there's variation in analytical methods. Um, in 2009, the method was not as sensitive, had a shorter list of compounds. Um, and then we were combining data from different spots in South Bay, like Artesian Slough, that freshwater spot, versus you know, all the, going all the way up to uh, Redwood City Harbor. Um, so there's some spatial variation, and then there's different species. Um, but 
as of 2019, we're going to start having a more consistent uh, baseline and uh, design to measure trends. Um, but um, overall, we've the, the averages here shown by the bars are pretty similar across these years, and 81% of all the South Bay fish have been above that 3.5 part per billion threshold. Um, so PFOS appears to be persisting over time in spite of the fact that uses of PFOS and PFOSA were phased out a long time ago. So some key takeaways. We're building a strong data set for the Bay. Uh, took a major step forward in 2019 and then with the supplemental work. PFAS are in Bay fish and PFOS is the predominant concern. The levels are well above consumption thresholds established by other states. South Bay appears to be higher. And um, Miguel's working on a draft report and a manuscript that will be coming soon. I want to talk quickly about what's next. There's going to be a, a, a lot of action with uh, fish monitoring and PFAS monitoring in fish in the Bay in the next couple of years. And we actually did some more this year. Um, starting to look at prey fish as part of status and trends. Amy mentioned this earlier um, at 12 locations shown in the, the upper map um, and looking at top smelt and sculpin and sculpin is a particularly good PFAS indicator. So that'll be interesting. In 2024, we're gonna give PFAS the full PCB treatment and analyze PFAS more completely across species and locations throughout the Bay. So we won't need to necessarily dip into archives to supplement that. And then there's some other um, PFAS oriented projects that I wanna mention briefly. Um, one is a, a neat one with um, led by all positives possible, a community organization in Vallejo um, and funded by EPA. And they're, they're, this project is um, focused on a lot of issues in the Carquina Strait region that their community is facing, but fish contamination is one of them. And it will be sam we're, we're, we're um, supporting that project um, and uh, leading the fish monitoring effort. Um, there's two parts of it. Um, we're sampling at these four different locations in the Carquina Strait and measuring PFAS in addition to PCBs and mercury. So it'll be a great data set for this one small area. And uh, with one part of the project where we hired a contractor like we usually do to go out and collect fish from a boat. But we're also working with the community to have the community collect fish. Um, in the bottom right, I'm showing a, a training that we recently did with, with the community um, to talk about how to collect fish and use good um, clean technique. Um, so we're excited about that project for both the environmental justice and community engagement aspect of it, but also expanding the PFAS data set. The State Water Board is coming um, to the Bay region with their realignment sampling, which is also community guided monitoring that um, they're doing across the state. They started in San Diego region and um, moving next to the Bay region. And the communities are interested in PFAS. So I'm pretty sure we'll have PFAS on the list for that monitoring. And then um, another project funded by the Water Board, we're um, developing a consumption survey questionnaire that communities can use to do surveys of their communities. We're having a workshop uh, for that project on November 3rd. So these, all the slides get posted from all these presentations. So for, for posterity, I'm listing all, all the folks involved and then sources of more information. I'll leave it at that. Move on to the next speaker. Yeah. Oh, oh, I've ruined it now. Okay, I think that's good enough. Um, well, I'm here to provide the first few slides of the next PFAS presentation because um, Bakwa is so fortunate to have the RMP in its backyard to help assist us in developing science to support our management actions. Um, so I'm here to talk about a project 
that uh, wasn't conducted during the normal decision making process of the RMP that but, but BACWA paid for and um, supported separately from that. So I'm going to start with a slide that's another version of the slide that Jay shared. Um, there's a lot of PFAS compounds. These are PFOA and PFOS, which are two of the more than 10,000 PFAS compound, compounds that are out there. Uh, these two are have been the focus of regulatory actions, and that's why we keep highlighting them. But I do know that they've been phased out in, for manufacture in both the US and Europe, uh, although they are likely still manufactured in other countries and are coming into this country through imported products. Um, they are, as Jay said, ubiquitous in consumer products. So that and also in industrial uh, processes so that means that we are exposed to them constantly and that ubiquity leads to widespread environmental contamination so what do we do um there's a well trod in uh, regulatory pathway that says when you have a contamination issue in the environment you implement end of pipe treatment um, this is an analogy that I've seen used by a, a National Pollution Prevention Coalition that really illustrates that if you, there's no point starting to mop up the floor of the overflowing bathtub unless you actually turn off the tap as well. And so that's why as a community, as the public and as wastewater treatment plants that serve the public, we would like to invest our resources in looking at ways to turn off the tap, which wasn't isn't as simple as you would think, because many manufacturers often don't even know that there is PFAS in the products that they are manufacturing and selling to the public. So back in 2020, the State Water Board put out a statewide investigative order to many sectors, including the POTW or uh, wastewater uh, treatment sector. Uh, and the statewide investigative order required wastewater agencies to monitor influent, effluent, and biosolids uh, for PFAS compounds and, a, and a, a list of target compounds. So we are fortunate, as I said, to have the RMP, but also to have very enlightened regulators that encouraged us to work with the RMP that has a mature PFAS program to look for other ways to spend our resources to get more actionable information out of any PFAS related monitoring that we are going to do. And so in lieu of, of the statewide investigative order, which the State Water Board carved Region 2 out of, we proceeded with our own special study, which was conducted in a couple of phases. One was a screening phase, also looking at influent, effluent, and biosolids. Um, that was phase one. And then in phase two, we were able to work with some of our agencies that put a lot of elbow grease and staff time into this, looking upstream in the watersheds. Uh, so residential, subwatersheds, so popping open manholes, as well as some industries and uh, commercial establishments that weren't included in their own investigative orders. Uh, and in, in addition to looking at the target compounds, we were also able to look at aggregate measures of total PFAS, uh, which yielded some really interesting results. And now I'm going to pass it over to Diana to talk about what we have found. Thanks, Lorian. Um, so for this project, I had a great project team, I had Miguel Mendez and Kaylee Patterson. And as Lorian mentioned, BACWA members were also critical team members. They provided strategic direction, collected all of the samples, and supported data interpretation. SGS Access was our analytical partner and analyzed all of the samples. And like Lorian mentioned, we used target PFAS method that um, Jay mentioned includes an analyte list of approximately 40 compounds. And this is just a tiny fraction of the over 10,000 uh, PFAS compounds that might be out there. And so we also used another method called total oxidizable precursor method. Um, and in this approach, the sample is oxidized prior to analysis. And this converts a lot of the PFAS precursors to the terminal products, which are often these fully fluorinated perfluorocarboxylates like PFOA that we are able to quantify. So in this way, we're able to quantify a larger portion of the PFAS in our samples. 
So this is a graph from our phase one data showing it, uh, PFAS concentrations using the target method from a diverse set of POTWs that are kind of listed by their acronym on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have different PFAS analytes that are uh, shown in the different colors. And by stacking them, we're showing the sum of the PFAS that we're able to detect in the samples. So you can see from the concentration range, ranging from 10 to 60 in this graph, that the levels of PFAS among these POTWs were pretty consistent. We also continue to see PFOA and PFOS, these uh, long chain band compounds in our wastewater influent. But these levels are very consistent and comparable with other municipal wastewater studies, both in California and in other regions. One interesting thing we noted from phase one is that when we compare uh, the influent from POW, POTWs receiving 20% um, industrial flows with other facilities that receive um, very little to 0% industrial flows, we, don't see, we didn't see a correlation in the PFAS levels. Um, and so this was an important motivation for our phase two investigation um, to try to better understand PFAS sources. So I'll come back to that later. <clears throat> This next graph um, is showing similar set of data from our phase two, um, and the, the bar is showing the median concentration uh, from POTW's um, influent, and the error bars represent the minimum to maximum range of values. With the top method, we were able to measure significantly higher levels of PFAS in our compounds, in our samples, really illustrating how important it was to use this top method in addition to the target method. Here are the effluent uh, target and top results. Um, and then the target results are again, very consistent with uh, what other municipal wastewater facilities have reported. Top is actually a method that's surprisingly not widely used. So we don't have great comparables, but we do have our previous RMP data to compare to. So when we compare this most recent data set with our previous 2009, 2014 data, we see very no noticeable reductions in the levels of PFAS that we are able to quantify. And this is particularly notable uh, for the long chain PFAS like PFOA and PFOS, which might be attributed to the ban of these compounds. So we might be seeing some trends. Another trend we see from this is the reduction in the PFAS levels when we compare influent and effluent. And a lot of this is going to the biosolids. So this graph shows the biosolid concentration of PFAS from facilities that um, use anaerobic digestion. And so um, these levels show um, biosolid concentrations in the hundreds of nanograms per gram range. And while PFAS and biosolids is a growing concern, just to put it in context, these are levels that have been reported um, in cosmetics, food packaging, and textiles. So we've learned a lot about PFAS and wastewater, but like Lorian mentioned, we really wanted to understand PFAS sources in order to inform management actions. And so for this study, we really wanted to do upstream sampling to try to understand what are the contribution from residential sources, because I mentioned in that first graph, we didn't see a strong correlation with the industrial discharge levels with PFAS. We also wanted to screen a few priority industries to see if we might identify some high sources of PFAS that might inform the pretreatment program. And so we work closely with BACWA participants to identify sampling locations upstream within the sewer shed to, to start distinguishing between these various sources. And since this is the first time we were doing this study, our approach was to do this as a screening study. <clears throat> So um, to look at residential sources, um, again, to doing, using a screening approach, we wanted to uh, include a diverse array of neighborhoods. And so BACWA participants identified 14 neighborhoods that we could sample that included um, different geographic locations, different types of housing, and hopefully we were also capturing different socioeconomic groups. So this next graph shows um, the PFAS concentrations we, were we measured in the residential discharges from these 14 neighborhoods using the top method. And you can see the levels are very significantly from uh, concentrations just above our detection limits up to 900 nanograms per liter. Um, and even one location where when we were able to sample three times, we saw very different levels. 
So this next graph shows um, how these residential concentrations uh, compared with influent. And so the median was slightly below influent levels, but the range was really significant and it, um, it overlaps with the influent levels. So based on these uh, measurements, um, I estimate that a municipal uh, wastewater facility that receives 80% residential flows could expect that a majority of their PFAS loadings is coming from residential discharges. So next we want to do a screening study of some priority industries that might be discharging PFAS. And so we came up with this list of priority industries that we wanted to study in this study, um, including industrial laundry, hospitals, sites with chrome plating, as well as semiconductor manufacturing. And as much as possible, we tried to include multiple locations for each of these industries, but we also included some unique sites that BACWA members were really interested in sampling. So um, for industrial laundry, um, BACWA members identified five businesses that we could sample by leveraging ongoing compliance activities. So these are um, industrial laundry, so it's not your household laundromat. These are uh, businesses that service other businesses. And so the top laundered items is restaurant linens and floor mats as well as some other types of uniforms. Um, these all have industrial discharge permits um, and are part of the pretreatment program. So this first graph shows the levels of PFAS measured in the industrial laundry discharge um, of the first four facilities. And as you can see, most of these samples are at, the, at least at the three times level of influent, even up to 14 times. And we also had a fifth location. Um, so this is the same set of data, but now I've added um, E, where the levels were 400 times um, levels that we're measuring in influent. So we're measuring really high levels of PFAS in industrial laundry discharge. Um, this uh, site E, I don't have enough information to determine if that's an outlier or if we were just lucky in capturing a larger flow. And so the average across all of these samples um, is 15,000. So I wanted to use this number to kind of estimate whether these flows are, uh, these levels are significant. And so considering one facility having a discharge permit of 2.5 million gallons per year and using the mean value among all our uh, among all of our samples at 15,000 i estimate that one facility discharging 0.01% of flows could contribute 1% of pfas loadings Next, we also wanted to look at sites with chrome plating as well as um, locations that are related with semiconductor manufacturing because we know that PFAS is used in these industrial processes. And again, this is just a screening study, but the levels that we measured um, from these businesses were low compared to influent. We also um, sampled from four hospital locations um, and this ended up including domestic waste as well as laboratory space. And most of these samples were actually below our detection limits and so well below influent. We also sampled three car wash locations because um, we know that PFAS might be used in car products. And we also looked at a military site, a jail and pulp paper board manufacturing. And the samples from all of these are grouped in this graph. Um, and so all of the levels were kind of in the range of influent levels, but no very obvious outliers from our samples. So from the study, we've learned a lot, and we found that it was really important in applying these different analytical methods to help us capture different parts of this PFAS picture. We also found sewer shed monitoring to be really effective in um, investigating PFAS sources. And we really provided a really unique data set by having this collaboration with BACWA. We found residential discharges to be important sources of PFAS to the sewer shed, and that industrial laundry discharges high levels of PFAS. Our temporal data suggest declines in these phase out PFAS but there are still important analytical challenges that prevent us from comprehensively evaluating PFAS levels in our samples, as well as evaluating trends. And so we're continuing to follow the science as new uh, methods are being developed to help us measure PFAS. 
Looking forward, um, SFEI is looking forward to continuing to work with BACWA and learn from this study and implement um, similar types of study to investigate sewer shed sources. And this future wastewater study is being incorporated as part of a larger study um, to systematically look at PFAS sources in order to inform management. So we will have a final report that will be uh, released publicly end of the year. Um, and you can visit our website for more information. And I look forward to the uh, panel for further discussion. Thanks. Hi, hello everybody, hello everyone. Cosmetics contribute to the PFAS load at wastewater treatment plants in California. So now you know how this story ends. I could stop here, but if you're willing, for the next 15 minutes, I'd like to take you on a journey to understand how we got to this conclusion and um, maybe also what this means for you and your work and um, what this really yeah, what, what caveats are together with this conclusion. So it, um, I guess you've already heard that um, PFASs are everywhere, right? They're in so many different products. And because they're everywhere, it's really difficult to understand exposure. It's very complex. There's manufacturing sources, there's consumer product sources. And so that makes it very difficult to understand the sources at wastewater treatment plants as the BACWA study showed. Um, and actually last February, I was attending the SFEI uh, PFAS in Bay uh, Fish workshop. And that's where I, I was surprised to hear that the municipal sources seem to be more important than previously thought. And that kind of triggered this idea that, you know, maybe we can do a back of the envelope calculation to figure out what goes down the drain from cosmetics. And by that, I mean also personal care products. So anything that you apply on your skin for you know, personal care or for beauty. And that back of the envelope calculation turned out to require a lot of work, a massive spreadsheet, a lot of attention to detail, and a lot of decisions about how to deal with the data gaps, and also how to um, combine these different data sources to tell a coherent story. And we knew going into this that we are not going to find a lot of information, but we thought, well, if our estimates are so outrageous, maybe somebody will give us better data. <laughs> so we're still um, in the process of uh, publishing our results. Uh, we submitted to environmental uh, science and technology and uh, our papers in review. So hopefully we're going to have it out there soon and uh, see what kind of responses we get. But you're going to get a sneak peek of that. So we started by trying to understand what PFAS ingredients are used in cosmetics. And we went to uh, uh, several different databases, right? Some of these are publicly available, others we had to request the data from, others we had to pay for. So it was a little bit of a mix, uh, but all of these PFAS compounds that we looked at are actual ingredients, right? They are on the ingredient label. So you can go home and look at your cosmetics and check the label and see, do the ingredients contain the word fluoro? Because if they do, then they're probably part of the PFAS class. So we found 40 distinct compounds used as ingredients after removing a handful that were propellants because we figured those that are just used as propellants are not really gonna make it down the drain or not as much. Uh, we wanted to focus on what really gets washed off. Um, we also excluded one that had just the general name um, and we couldn't really figure out the chemical structure so we couldn't do anything with it. Um, but most of the ingredients are there and I know this is really small um, and you can't see it, but I um, just wanted to point out that if you look at the PFAS universe, we are very focused on what's on the left side, right? That's the stuff that we can measure. Uh, you know, that's PFOA, PFOS, and also a few of their precursors, but generally the perfluoroalkyl acids. But these on the right, in the middle and right, were the ones used in products. And so, you know, here in the middle, 
guess I don't have a pointer. Um, we have the perfluoroalkyl acid precursors. So we call those pre-PFAAs because they, they convert into perfluoroalkyl acids, including during wastewater treatment. Um, and then there was also the fluoropolymers and a bunch of other polymeric PFAS compounds that we found in cosmetics that maybe don't degrade into PFAAs, but they can contain PFAs as impurities potentially. And so this is what we measure, right? What we typically measure um, is very different from what's in products. However, like Diana mentioned, there's also the top assay. And in the top assay, you basically cleave off these fluorinated side chains attached to these longer molecules. And those fluorinated side chains eventually become perfluoroalkyl acids or PFAAs. So in a top assay, you usually um, measure basically um, the PFAAs after the reaction and you subtract the PFAAs before the reaction to get basically the mass of these fluorinated side chains that are circled there. So we thought, okay, if we could do a back of the envelope calculation to calculate the mass of those side chains in cosmetics sold in California, then we could compare that to top assay data from the BACRA study or from any other study in California. And we could also calculate the total amount of fluorine in those ingredients and compare that to total organic fluorine measurements of wastewater, like um, extractable or adsorbable organic fluorine. So even though we cannot directly quantify the majority of those 40 ingredients that we found in cosmetics, we have a way to get at it through the top assays and through the total organic fluorine. Um, and, you know, really the only way for us to, to figure out what comes from cosmetics is to calculate it. So that's, that's what we try to do. Um, and to actually calculate this, we, um, looked at both the total mass of the PFAS ingredients, the organic fluorine present in those ingredients, as well as the, the mass of the fluorinated side chains. And so we needed, first of all, to understand the total mass of cosmetics sold in California during one year. And for that, we use the Nielsen Consumer LLC database that provides data on a lot of different consumer products, including um, a bunch of cosmetics. We also had to figure out what fraction of products in each of the 16 product categories that we found contain a PFAS ingredient. And, you know, interestingly, that fraction is really low. It was below five or four percent for all the product categories. So you think, OK, that probably means cosmetics are not that significant of a contributor because so few products contain a PFAS ingredient. We also had to figure out the concentration of each of those PFAS ingredients in each of those product types. And that was the hardest thing to do, right? Nobody, it's written on the label, right? But nobody tells you how much is added. We, we did a lot of search on the internet to find um, product data, uh, product data sheets or safety data sheets or things like that, or even um, information from the chemical manufacturers of those cosmetic ingredients with guidance for how that ingredient can be used. But the concentration ranges that we found for all of those product types often varied by two orders of magnitude. So that really uh, is you know, a, a big range. And so what we ended up having to do for our results is to provide a range. We didn't even attempt to provide uh, summary statistics for our estimates. We just did the minimum and the maximum. In our minimum estimates, we used all the lowest values for you know, the amount of products in California, the, um, the concentration of the chemical. And in the max, we used you know, all the max values. Um, we also had to figure out how much fluorine was in each of those PFAS ingredients because, you know, in order to calculate the total organic fluorine, um, and that wasn't easy either because some of those ingredients were fluoropolymers that had a formula like, you know, here's a, here's a repeating unit that repeats X times. All right, how big is X? It could be one, it could be a thousand, we don't know. So again, we had to make some decisions and use a range. Um, and lastly, we needed to know which of those PFAS ingredients can potentially degrade into perfluoroalkyl acids. 
um, so that we can consider those um, PFA precursors and compare them to the top assay data. So um, yeah, and I forgot to mention that it was actually difficult also to find the, the total mass of cosmetics because some of the data that we got was in volume instead of mass, and we had to find the density of the products to convert to mass, and that uh, was also very difficult to find. So a lot of assumptions went into this. That's why our results look like this. So here, what you see, um, the, the bars basically show you our uncertainty. The bottom dots are our minimum estimates, the top dots are our maximum estimates. And um, as you can see, there's you know, different product categories um, in here that we looked at. And what it comes down to is that the cosmetics sold in California during a one year period contain somewhere between 650 and 56,000 kilograms of PFSs. And by this, I mean you know, all the PFS ingredients that are on the label, not impurities. There may be additional impurities, but just what's labeled, just whatever is on the label. Um, and of those, 330 to 20,000 kilograms are fluorinated side chains that during wastewater treatment can potentially become perfluoroalkyl acids. And we try to also take a look at which of these products contribute the most. So on the left side, you see our um, minimum estimates. On the right side, you see our maximum estimates of organic fluorine and the fluorinated side chains. And what you can see is that, you know, overall shaving creams and gels, hair care, facial cleansers, and sun care products accounted for the majority of the total organic fluorine, as well as the total PFAS mass. I'm not showing it here, but there are also over 90% of the total PFAS mass in cosmetics um, in California. So those seem to be really the, the biggest contributors. And in contrast, makeup accounted for less than 3%. Um, often when you hear about PFAS in cosmetics, you hear makeup. Uh, but they were really a small contributor overall um, and in makeup we included all of these product types so that's why i'm only showing you eight different categories here even though we looked at 16 product categories because we lumped all these nine different product types under makeup they were you know small enough to be combined together now one caveat i'll give you is that lotions and moisturizers they didn't rise to the top but that may be because our product sales data that was available to us included only lotions and moisturizers for the face so i'm sure there's a lot more out there that is applied on the entire body and we're definitely underestimating the lotions and moisturizers so that's my caveat um, also what was interesting if you look at the fluorinated side chains there you really have two product types that rose to the top hair care products and facial cleansers they appear to contribute over 80 percent of the perfluoroalkyl precursors in cosmetics and makeup in contrast all makeup products combined were less than 1.6 percent so we try to compare our results to wastewater data and we couldn't find any total organic fluorine data in California. If there is, please let me know. I would love to, to get my hands on it. Um, but we found some other studies. They were all from Europe. That's why we didn't try to calculate the percent because it wasn't you know, maybe that relevant. Um, but in red, you have the data from Europe, wastewater levels, and then in blue, those are our estimates. Again, the bottom is our min scenario, the, the top of the bar is our max scenario. And as you can see, it's kind of in the same range, right? So presumably, cosmetics contribute fairly significantly to the PFAS load at wastewater treatment plants. Now, looking at the California data, we, uh, we um, got the BACWA data and um, we um, basically used the median to compare to our estimates for the PFA precursors. So top assay data and PFA precursor data. And what we found is that cosmetics contribute at least 4%. At least 4% of the precursor derived PFAs measured at wastewater treatment plants in the Bay Area. Our high estimate, as you can see, is way above 100%. So clearly that's not right. Um, but the answer is somewhere in there, right? Be between 4% and 100%. So 
you know, <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> it's, um, it's interesting, right? When you start looking into that and you see the lack of information, it could be 99% as far as you know, but at least 4%, that's what we'll go with for now. Um, what's interesting though, um, is that some of those perfluoroalkyl acids include PFOA, PFOA. If you look at um, the ingredient list, you'll see, uh, we'll share the slides, right? So you'll be able to take a look. Some of those ingredients um, are precursors to either PFOA or even the C9. So they, they can have a, they have a side chain with seven, eight or nine carbons. And one of those was actually the fourth most common ingredient that we found. So they're pretty common in these products. There is of course the possibility that manufacturers reformulated and they didn't update the labels. That is a potential, but it was really surprising to see the number of products that contained long chain perfluoroalkyl acid precursors in their ingredient lists. And there have been studies that actually looked for PFOA in cosmetics and they did find it. So I'm pretty sure that cosmetics are a source of PFOA to wastewater treatment plants. Now, here's another thing. Um, the BACWA data um, only looked at carbon chain lengths that had three or more um, carbons. The, the top assay only looked at things that had three or more carbons. But we had a lot of uh, ingredients that had only one or two fluorinated carbons in the chain. So those would not have been included in uh, the top assay data. Um, so you see those here in the right. Um, the, those are basically, that's the amount that we've estimated, including our entire data set. So some of those will release um, trifluoroacetic acid or TFA at wastewater treatment plants. And TFA is a chemical that is also very persistent. It's not bioaccumulative, but it is an aquatic toxicant. And it used to be studied back in the 90s before PFOA and PFOS became the next big thing, uh, they can be measured at the same time. So um, research has kind of moved towards PFOA and PFOS and left TFA behind. Uh, but at ACS uh, back in August, there was a great talk by John Cah Cahill, I'm mispronouncing his last name, I'm sure, uh, from Arizona State University. And he did a transect in the streams from San Francisco to the Sierra Nevada 25 years ago and measured TFA levels um, of 40 ppb on average. And he repeated the study in 2021 and found the six-fold increase. So the levels appear to be going up in, in many areas, and I'm sure cosmetics are contributing at least to wastewater treatment plants. So with that, um, it takes a village to do this work. I wanted to recognize my co-authors for this paper that hopefully we'll get to publish and uh, you'll get to read. Um, I'd also really like to thank RSFEI collaborators and, and Baco as well for sharing the data. But really this story is, is ongoing, right? This is to be continued. Um, as you may have heard, um, Assembly Bill 2771 banned PFAS containing cosmetics in California beginning January um, 2025. So will the levels go down? And I think that's where we might actually be able to see, will we see a decrease at wastewater treatment plants as a result of this starting January 1st, 2025? The challenge is that um, you won't really be able to tell the contribution of cosmetics necessarily because at the same time, textiles are also banned, um, also starting January 1st, 2025. But still, it would be really great to repeat the monitoring study and see if you can notice a measurable decrease of at least four percent as cosmetics are being banned maybe more um so yeah I, I hope you repeat the study i would love to to learn the results and if you'd like to stay in touch um, here's my contact information thank you Okay, so now we'll open it up to questions. Any questions from the room? I'm relaying Zoom questions. So um, the first is for Jay. 
what is the main way that PFOS get into fish from sediment and sediment organisms or from phytoplankton in the water column? And what is your hypothesis as to why the lower South Bay is so high? Is it me? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't uh, have a great answer for the first question, how it gets into the fish. I know it's a combination of um, <clears throat> uptake from the water and also uptake from food. Um, but I haven't really reviewed that literature, um, so don't have a better, more precise answer than that right now. What was part two? Oh, White South Bay. Um, I also don't have a great answer for that one. <laughs> um, it, I thought it was really interesting to get some data from the other parts of the bay that we could compare, you know, apples and apples with the Shiner Surf Perch and um, Richmond Harbor was... Um, very low, so I thought that was interesting, but I think obviously there's a lot of wastewater in the South Bay. That's probably the, you know, the first hypothesis about what's going on there. And also, you know, we always keep in mind the, the long residence time there. Um, but, uh, you know, I think as we gather more data, we'll be getting a lot more fish data from around the bay. Um, we'll fill in that picture and, and maybe get some some more hypotheses about what's going on with the spatial patterns. I, <clears throat> I um, am worried that it could be the same uh, story all over again. Um, the the fact that we're there might be declines in the in the wastewater plants, but we're not seeing declines in the fish um, suggests one similarity to PCBs, and that there's a big reservoir possibly out in the bay already that's really slowing the the rate of decline. Um, you know they're both super persistent. Um, their partitioning in the in the bay is a little different, but um, probably you know, PCB PCBs associated with sediment particles, and they get trapped really effectively. And we see still really strong gradients around the in, in small areas around the edge of the bay. Maybe PFAS aren't quite as uh, sticky as PCBs in that way, since they're they're not partitioning is you know the sediment in the same way um so basically i you know i'm i'm kind of worried that it's another decadal scale recovery process that we'll have to go through even though the the uh the the uses were phased out like 20 years ago now um so it's not it's kind of looking kind of uh scarily uh similar to pcbs uh, but um, maybe it won't be as bad Yeah, Jay, remember, we, we had similar concerns with the brominated compounds, but fortunately there we saw a decline. But I think there's a, so much more uh, PFAS has, has been used and continue to be used. You're right. I think we got a challenge with the reservoir, and, and there's so much more mobile than, than those other compounds. But for Sonoma, just more of a clarification than a, than a, than a question. To, the, when you're referring to the cosmetics and the legislation, was that also the broad definition? 
because I've always thought of that as just being sort of a, a narrow definition, but you impressed me with the, the way you looked at cosmetics being all these other things. And then the second part of the question, what's next in your back of the envelope uh, venture? Great questions, thank you. Um, yeah, so the ban um, pertains- Could you repeat the question for the Zoom before? Answering, please. Oh, sure. So the first question was whether the legislative ban included the entire class, um, and it does. It defines PFAS as um, um, organic chemicals that have at least one fully fluorinated carbon atom. So it's pretty much it's everything that um, we included, and it may be even more. I don't know. We try to we used um, in our study all the compounds that met the OECD definition of PFAS. But there may have been others that just met the AB 2771 definition. I think he was asking on the products. Does it include the lotions? And oh, the product scope. Yes, yes. It includes all, all cosmetics. Mm -hmm. yeah. The good ones you probably didn't touch because you didn't have data. Full body cream. Right, yes. Tell, tell the audience what Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like yes, it, included, uh, it includes all products, uh, including the full body. Um, Yes, we did find, um, we looked for all types of products that contain PFAS ingredients, um, but we could only calculate the values for the ones that we had data for. And yeah, the bill includes everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And your second question was what we're working on next. Um, I guess Jen will give a presentation in the second part of the afternoon session about some of our ongoing efforts. But not on PFAS, right? Um, in terms of PFAS, you know, there's um, there a lot of places we could go to. For now, we um, one of the places we're exploring is artificial turf. Um, that was something that our stakeholders brought to our attention when we were uh, regulating carpets and rugs. Um, and they said that we should also take a look at artificial turf. So we are. Um, we're planning a public workshop to look at not only PFASs, but also other kind of chemicals in artificial turf and figure out where to go from there. Yeah, we, um, okay, what, the question was, why did we choose the fish, species, fish species, and then how are we reporting the information? Is it programmed? So yes, it's um, for the human health exposure assessment. The WEHA likes to use the data as a, a nanogram program wet weight, because that's how the fish is consumed. So that's what, that's what we report the data as. Um, and the species that we look at are uh, selected because they're popular for consumption and then also they represent um, a variety of different exposure pathways so some are more benthic feeders some are like striped bass higher in the food web and so you know some like mercury and pcbs accumulate to higher levels because they're uh, at higher levels in the food chain um, so we we look at a it, a variety of species for those different reasons and you know also in different places you get different species so that's why we we look at a suite of species because they you know we see different um different species um, accumulating more uh, for different contaminants and in different different uh circumstances Yeah, and that's part of why fish at the top of the food chain 
have high levels of mercury or um, high levels of PCBs? It has to do with the, the amount that they're consuming and the size of the prey. I th oh, that's very loud. Um, I think the question is, uh, if, if we have any rationale for why we have seen high levels of PFAS in the industrial laundry. Um, and I think it's most likely from the textiles. Um, we know that textiles are treated with PFAS. Maybe uniforms might be more likely to be treated with PFAS to make them uh, stain resistant, oil resistant, or like, um, fireproof or something like that and so that, that's my hypothesis for the industrial laundry possibly and maybe it's just like the ratio of like laundered items to water used A short question: uh, the, the amount of uh, Chinook salmon now it was is it non-existent? Have you're looking at that at all in terms of this uh, chemicals that are in the? We have looked at salmon in the bay. I think it's been a while, um, but we've also looked at salmon throughout California, and they it, it, there's good news for sa regarding salmon that they tend to be low in PCBs and mercury. Um, we don't have PFAS data for salmon though. So, but I would expect that they're probably low as well. Uh, Diana, I mean, I think if you look that there's PFAS, PFOA in many clothes, um, many exercise clothes, clothes they're water resistant. Um, so that may be an answer to your industrial laundry question. Lorian, I'm wondering in the context of PFOS or PFOA, how, how do you envision or do wastewater treatment plants envision this kind of impacting pretreatment programs? Like how would the information be used from a pretreatment standpoint, given the, this is not dental amalgam, you know, this is, this is something completely different. Um, what kind of controls would be put in place um, from a from a pretreatment standpoint? Yeah, to quote Jay, I don't have a good answer for that one yet. Um, I thought that what was notable in Diana Diana's presentation was the fact that there were eye popping concentrations of PFAS coming out of a couple of the industrial laundries. And yet, when you actually do a mass balance, it was a tiny sliver of what was coming into wastewater treatment plants, which was largely from the products that we use in our homes and that we're exposed to in our homes. So I think it's a little bit premature to start thinking about pretreatment, but certainly it's something that we have in our mind and often speak about at our, our pretreatment uh, committee meetings. Hi, so we heard a lot about the total oxidizable precursor assay, the top assay, um, and how that can, you know, aid in our determination of like contribution of precursors. Um, but did y'all consider in your studies, 
the contribution of specific chain length precursors versus just the total change in PFAS concentrations uh, when trying to attribute different sources? I think we were trying to look at PFAS fingerprints, but because PFAS, um, th there, there are transformations and stuff, um, you, they can break down into the smaller chain. And so I didn't, I, I guess I didn't see any very clear fingerprint patterns to try to link to specific sources. I think we might have to, okay, go to the Zoom. Um, another question for Diana. Can you talk about the disadvantaged neighborhoods where you did the testing at all any more than what you already have said? Um, I don't know if any of the neighborhoods would count as disadvantaged. We did try to include diverse neighborhoods. This wasn't meant to be a representative study design, and so we didn't there wasn't any clear factors that might explain the differences between the neighborhoods that we sampled. But great question. It is something that we wanted to ask. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. There's one out there. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap us up then with um, what do you think are the next steps with this, you know, screening sewer sewer shed uh, study, or are there next steps in? Um, yeah, I think we're kind of putting a placeholder. We've learned a lot from this process, and so we want to do more of it. And we also learned that we still have analytical gaps. And so in future iterations, I think we would want to use diverse PFAS analytical methods. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we are incorporating this as part of a larger proposal where we want to more systematically look at PFAS sources and try to link them. Um, not all products will lead to wastewater pathways. Some of them might be used outdoors and it might go into urban runoff. And so we want to uh, kind of do this more systematically, develop a conceptual model to link what types of products might lead to different pathways, and then inform DTSC's um, safer consumer program um, to, to prioritize certain types of products. To turn off the tap. <laughs> okay, great. So let's thank our um, speakers. Thank you. All right, here's the um, break now until 3.05. Please return at 3.05.